So on this first problem, uh, we ended last time and we, we determined that what was going on here was that we were in the first quadrant in the xy plane, right? And uh, that the radius was going between zero and two, which would have the effect of kind of getting a quarter circle in the xy plane in the first quadrant. And then, so like this, basically this stuff right here that I'm kind of outlining in blue. And then letting z go between zero and four is going to have the effect of uh, giving us a salt, uh, like turning this all into a solid, yeah? Okay, so like this. Does that make sense? So we got that, that little quarter cylinder solid, right? Now I wanna look at this second one because it's a little bit more unusual. And then the other two just kind of follow suit. So first of all, look at this second one, letter, letter B. It says that theta goes between zero and two pi, which is going to spin us all the way around the z-axis, yes? That means we're going all the way around the z-axis, whatever, whatever this thing is that we're looking at. R is between zero and A. R is between zero and A, all right? So what that means is if I just look at these two things right here, and I was just like looking in the XY plane, what would that be sketching out? Think about it. If I were just to look at those first two inequalities for theta and R, what would that sketch out? If I, if I said, if I took all theta and all R satisfying these things, what would I get? What would I get? Yeah, Daniel. No, R is not a constant. A is a constant. R is moving in that range, yes? So theta is moving in between zero and two pi. R is moving between zero and A, correct? So what is that gonna sketch out? I go to any angle between zero and two pi, and I say any radius from zero up to A is permitted. What is that gonna sketch out in the XY plane? Cylinder or in two-dimensional space? Oh, it'll be oh, a disc. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so like, so like this, you know, you know what's going on here. So, so what's going on here is, is we're getting basically this from those first two things in the X, Y plane. Correct. Now, the thing is, you have, the thing you have to be careful of is that's sort of like a shadow of what's happening in with the whole solid, okay? So this is describing the behavior of X and Y. And now it's up to us to figure out what's going on with Z. Okay, so what is going on with Z? So Z, whatever R is, Z is trapped between R and A, okay? Z is trapped between whatever R currently is and A, okay? So like, this disc right here is kind of the shadow of the solid down in the XY plane. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is like the shadow of what's happening with X and Y. But then Z is going to determine what stuff actually belongs in the solid. Okay. So what is R equal to Z? So, so like if I go down to the left-hand side of this inequality, what does R equal to Z mean? Well, if I square both sides, that would be R squared is equal to Z squared. Do you know what I'm saying? So I would get X squared plus Y squared equals Z squared. What is that? We've, we've been messing around with quadric surfaces quite a bit. What is that? So like what I'm saying is th that's the extreme end of this inequality. R would be equal to Z. And that gave rise to this. What is this? What does this equation determine? A cone. Yeah? So the lower end of this is like a cone, yes? So Z starts on this cone. Z starts on the cone, because that's at the lower end of this, and it goes up to a height of A. That's just a flat numerical uh, 
uh, kind of chop off point for Z, yes? So whatever X and Y are, okay, well, or whatever R and theta are, uh, Z starts on the cone given by R equal to Z and goes up to a height of A, yeah? So isn't that going to produce something like this? Let me just kind of erase some of this. Isn't that going to produce something like this? Let's, let's draw a picture, okay? Okay, so first of all, I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna draw the shadow of this thing. I'll, I'll do it in black so that it, you know, so that it really kind of reminds you of a shadow, if you will, okay? So here's this shadow of a disc of radius A, okay? So here's the shadow down here. And then what's going on with Z? Well, Z is really kind of, okay. Z is really kind of, so, so here, I'm really trying my best not to kind of mess the picture up here, okay? So here's this cone, okay? And that black part is kind of the shadow of this thing. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna color the ring of the cone with a, oh man, that's not, that's not gonna work. I'm gonna use a different color, like green or something. Okay, so here's the ring of the cone right here. Okay, so there's that cone. And, uh, and this thing has a nice top to it. And where is the height of the top? Just so we're on the same page, where's the height of the top of the cone? What's the highest value Z can take on? What's the highest value Z takes on? A, yes? So the solid here, the solid here is this thing right here. It's this cone that kind of has the top part of it just hacked off at height A, yes? And this down here is the shadow of it down in the X, Y plane. Okay, so Z, if I go to any value, uh, X, Y down in here, okay? Z starts on the cone and goes up, 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 up until it hits, until it hits this maximum height of A, okay? So this thing is gonna sketch out this cone-shaped solid. Yeah, it's a cone-shaped solid. Uh, if I were to look down from it on top, you would see sort of a circle of radius A down in the X, Y plane. But that, that, or that disc of radius A doesn't really participate in the solid. It just kind of, it tells you where X and Y are specifically, yeah? Okay. All right, questions on that? Any questions on that? Any questions on that? The other two I thought, I think are a little bit more straightforward. Um, this one looks complicated because the upper end of rho uh, is rho, rho basically equaling a over cosine of phi, but that just means, I mean, <laughs> after if I multiply through by cosine of phi, I get rho cosine of phi equals a. But remember, rho cosine of phi—that's the formula for z, don't you know? Yes. So really, the upper end is just z equal to a, if you will. A. Okay? So the z coordinate is equal to a. Okay, so rho starts at zero and it goes out until it reaches a height of z, okay, a height above the xy plane, a height above the xy plane of z. Okay? In fact, let's just let's actually just uh, sketch this thing out. So let me just uh, let me just clear this out. This guy right here, this guy right here, the upper end of this inequality, rho equal to a over cosine of phi, oops, phi, not theta, okay, phi, that corresponds to z equaling to a, okay, that's what the upper end of this is, okay, so rho starts at a, at a length of zero from the origin and goes out till z equals a. So what's going on with these first two? Well, theta is just spinning all the way around the z-axis, and phi is going between zero and pi over six. Okay, phi is going between zero and pi over six. So you can kind of imagine coming out away from the z-axis out to like 30 degrees, okay? And rho goes from zero to, 
um, to wherever the height is actually equal to A. So I'm telling you, once again, what we are going to get here is a, what? What do you guys think? What's this going to be again? We spin all the way around. B goes out to 30 degrees away from the z-axis and then it can do that anywhere. 30 degrees out away from the z-axis anywhere. What is that starting to look like if I do that, right? I can go anywhere around the z-axis and that thing can go out anywhere zero to 30 degrees. That's looking like a cone, yes? But the stipulation that rho has to be between zero, so zero away from the origin out to a height of z equal to a just chops the thing off at height a, doesn't it? Yeah? So I'm telling you what we're gonna get again is something like this. All right, here's our, here's a little cone for you. And what's the height of this cone? What's the height of this cone? A, yeah? And what is the angle interior to this cone? What is this angle interior to the cone? Uh, pi over six. Yeah, pi over six. Okay, so there's the, there's that solid right there. Yeah, so sometimes things can look a little bit complicated on their head, but you just think about like flipping back and forth to the rectangular coordinates or something, okay? Whatever happens to be convenient. Okay? Yes, Daniel. Um, why is the height A and not A plus Why is the height A? So, theoretically. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, okay, so you have rho equal to A over cosine of, oh, I see. So what you're saying is, um, Okay, so rho is equal to A over cosine of phi. And what, what you were saying is, uh, is what, that that's going to be dependent on, you're saying that this, that depends on what phi actually is or something? I think I was just thinking that phi is root. P, that's rho. Oh, sorry, yeah. No, right, so rho is the actual distance away from the origin, yeah. Okay. So, and z in the spherical coordinates is rho cosine of phi, correct? Yeah, and that stipulation is that that has to be equal to a, yeah? And z, of course, is the vertical distance above the xy plane, yeah? Okay, you guys ready to move on to chapter? 12, okay, let's do it. This is the section on vector valued functions. So we're gonna start, we're gonna put some of our, our vector stuff into action again, and we'll finish with, we'll finish the semester with some nice applications of the stuff we've been learning about vectors in space, okay? It'll be exciting for sure. Uh, First thing we're gonna talk about is space curves. In this section, space curves given by so-called vector valued functions, okay? Vector valued functions, sometimes they're, sometimes they're just abbreviated VVFs, okay? <laughs> it's it's uh, tricky to write vector valued functions over and over, okay? Uh, and then we'll talk about limits and continuity for vector valued functions, okay? So let's talk about this. A curve in the plane can be described by parametrizing, yes? X could be a function of T and Y could be a function of T. This is what we spent a lot of our time in chapter 10 on, yeah? I uh, was talking about parametrizing curves in the plane, okay? Uh, we can do a similar thing in space Okay, we can parametrize curves in space. Uh, we just have to have a third function, yes? Namely, what, what is Z in terms of T, okay? F, G, and H, we usually wanna be continuous functions of T so that we get a nice curve.
curve in space when we let T move. And T is usually operating on some kind of interval that we just notate by I, okay? And actually, we can capture all of this as a vector. So we don't have to necessarily write x equal to f of t, y equal to g of t. In fact, we did this when we wrote down the various equations of a line in space. We had three different varieties of an equation of a line. The first was the vector equation of a line, yes? Then we equated the x, y, and z coordinates, and we got the parametric equations of a line, right? And then we got the symmetric equations of a line from that by solving for t. What we're doing here is we're kind of doing the same thing for general curves, not just lines anymore. We basically give the vector equation of a curve in space that doesn't necessarily have to be a line, okay? So, uh, so right, so these are, I like, to, I sometimes will call these vector, these are the, this is the vector equation of a curve in space. Okay, so the output, like if I, if I put, if I do an input of T, the output is a vector. That's why these are called vector valued functions. You input a value T, the output is a vector, yes? Input T, output vector. That's why it's a vector valued function, okay? Now, you know, you can write it using IJ form or using angled brackets, okay? And, and incidentally, I don't really, the book does a, spends a lot of time separating out the plane case and the space case, but to me, it all just kind of lives in space. Do you know what I mean? If we're talking about something in, in the XY plane, all right, fine. We'll kind of look at it in the XY plane. But in the end, the XY plane lives in space, yes? So you can kind of think of both of those things at the same time, okay? So even though the output is a vector, you, you only record the head of the vector, the terminal end of the vector, okay? So the output is a vector, which you think of as like an arrow, yes? but you only record the terminal end or the head of the vector, and that's how you get the curve, okay? That's what we did with lines after all, wasn't it? Right? Uh, you had these vectors kind of moving along the line in the vector equation of a line, but you didn't like think of all those vectors as being part of the line. You just recorded the end of those vectors, and that gave us the line in space, yeah? That vector equation of a line. Okay, so, so again, we're going to be primarily concerned with recording the, the point f of t, g of t, or f of t, g of t, h of t, which is the head or the terminal end of these vectors that are outputs. Okay, any questions on this, like the definition of a vector valued function or what it is that we're doing here? This is exactly what we did for lines, correct? <laughs> Except it's not a line necessarily anymore. It's just some kind of curve, yeah? So any questions on this before we move on? Okay. Uh, so the terminal point of the vector, again, we use kind of bold faced R of T, you know, you know, sometimes we'll write R arrow of T to indicate that the output of this thing is a vector coincides with the point X, Y or X, Y, Z on the curve given by the parametric equations. Okay. So you know, you might get this point here, you know, or this point or this point. We keep track of that. And also as T increases, it, it sort of induces an orientation on the curve, just like we did in two dimensional space, yes? So we can put an orientation on the curve that, that comes from letting T increase through its values, okay? So there's a curve in the plane, here's a curve in space, you know, this is the first value, second value, third. So this induces an orientation on these curves. Do you see that we're only tracking vector heads? Yeah, we're only tracking terminal ends of these things. Yes, the output are vectors, but we're really only concerned with where these things terminate. And that gives us our so-called space curve C, okay? That is the space curve C. 
okay, or plane curve, I guess. The book likes to make a, a big distinction, but who cares? They both actually live in space, okay, whether, whether we acknowledge that or not. Okay. We'll look at some examples of this shortly, but any, any, uh, any questions on this? This is merely an extension of what we were doing back in chapter 10, and it's a natural extension of what we were doing with lines. We had a vector equation of a line. Now we have a vector equation of a curve in space. Okay. Practical purpose of vector valued functions, if T represents time, then the vector valued function shows motion along a curve over time. Yes? You can kind of imagine moving along that curve over time. Yeah. So, so we'll have some nice physics applications. All right. Here's this. Uh, sketch the plane curve. And actually, we'll sketch it in space just to, just to spite the book, okay? Uh, sketch the plane curve represented by 2 sine t and negative 6 cos t. So this means x is 2 sine t and y is negative 6 cosine of t for 0 equal to or less than t equal to or less than 2 pi. Again, all we care about is the terminal end, i.e. the point x comma y for each value of t. What is that going to sketch? Like, what do you think that's going to sketch? Yeah. Yeah, it will be an ellipse. We have a distortion factor of two in the x direction, yeah? We have a distortion factor of negative six in the y direction, but that's that's going to keep us on, on an ellipse, on an ellipse in, in, okay? Um, and you could kind of sort that out uh, by hand if you wanted to, but, uh, and by the way, um, if you divided both sides by, or if you divided x by two and you divided y by six and added the square of those together, you would get the equation of an ellipse. That's that's what uh, you know. That's what's going on here. Okay. So because sine squared plus cosine squared is one. But let's go look at this thing in GeoGebra, shall we? That'll be that'll be fun for everybody. Okay. So let's look here. Uh, I don't have that there. I think it's over here, maybe. Yeah, here we go. Okay. So here's this. I've kind of put this curve in here. See, two sine t, negative six cos t. Uh, literally, I'm a complete buffoon when it comes to, uh, you know, GeoGebra. I just start typing curve, <laughs> kind of for space curve, and then it gives me all of the parameters necessary. So I plug in what x is, which is 2 sine t, what y is, which is negative 6 cos t, and then I put t from 0 to 2 pi. That will sketch out the whole thing. There it is. Do you see it? That's in the xy plane. If I really wanted to see this thing, oh man, I'm getting sick here. Okay. Uh, so there's the positive x-axis, the positive y-axis. Do you see that? Yeah. If I want to see motion along this, I can actually form the vector. So I put R of S and that means just plug in different values of S and then like let S move. And that will give me different vectors that it will sketch. So if I put this in here, that's, that's what I get if I plug in X S equal to zero. Do you see that? And if I let S move, it starts to give me different terminal endpoints. Do you see how we're kind of moving around on that thing? Yes, okay. So let me just kind of let this thing play. Okay, so that's what's happening as t goes from zero to two pi, and then it's just, I'm just letting it repeat itself. Do you see what's happening? And of course, all of this is really going on in space. You know what I mean? Yeah. It just happens to be hap going on down in the xy plane in this particular case. Make sense? Yeah. So that black curve is what we call the space curve for this vector valued function. That's the space curve or, or the plane curve in this case for that vector valued function, okay? All right, back over here. What about this? Three cos t, three sine t, two t, for t going between zero and four pi. First of all, how are x and y gonna be moving together? Think about it for a second. How will x and y move together? Like if I just concentrate on x and y, 
What, what's what's going to happen with those? That's going to be a circle of radius three, and it's going to be traversed how many times? Twice, right? So this is a circle, oops, circle of radius equal to three traversed two times, okay? Uh, well, what does Z do to, all, to this business? Now, Z starts at zero and it continues to increase up to four pi, yes? So as we move kind of in this circular rhythm with X and Y, Z continues to get bigger. What will that do to my curve? It'll be a spiral. Do you see what I'm saying? We'll kind of spiral up. It'll be like a spiral staircase type situation, yes? So when you kind of think about what's happening with Z, namely Z is kind of increasing with T, you imagine sort of a spiral staircase type situation going on. Okay, so let's go take a peek at that, shall we? All right, so here, uh, so there was that. Let me, let me get rid of this gem, okay? Yeah. And let me get rid of that, okay? So here's this curve. It was three cos t, three sine t, t. Uh, you know, you have the option of having three things. t going from zero to four pi, okay? And then what I did is I formed a vector. I called this curve w. I formed a vector that was, that has as, an, as its endpoint w of a. All right, so I put that back to the beginning. Okay, so here's this curve. It's what we thought, yes? Kind of this spiral thing. I think if I zoom out, I'll get more of the curve, okay? There's a circle of radius three and this thing is kind of spiraling up. Do you see that? Okay, so that's pretty interesting stuff, okay? Looks like a circle down in the XY plane, which is exactly what we expect, but this thing gets spiraled around the Z axis as we go. Okay, uh, if I plug in A equal to zero, I get the vector three, zero, zero. Boom, there it is right there. You see it? Three, zero, zero. And watch what happens here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom in. Okay, so if I, if I zoom in here and I kind of let this thing run, it just, you'll, you'll see it just going around the circle, okay, a couple of times, right? So one, and two, it went around twice. Yes, one, two, okay? And then it kind of starts over. Yes, that's kind of fun. But what's really happening is we have to go into the third dimension and we see this thing kind of spiraling upwards. Do you see what I mean? Yeah? So that space curve is given by that. Look, it looks like it kind of goes invisible for a minute. That's because the, the viewing box needs to be expanded to see what's happening here. Okay. Oops, that's the wrong direction. Okay, so there it is right there. So then you can kind of see the vector moving up that staircase and the space curve itself is simply the collection of those terminal endpoints of the vectors. Yeah? Any questions on that? I think that's pretty cool. Questions? Uh, GeoGebra is pretty slick. Okay, so let me get rid of that. Back over here. Okay, let's uh, push ourselves a little bit harder. Represent a vector valued function, represent as a vector valued function, the space curve, which is the intersection of the surfaces given by those two things, x equal to z squared, and uh, that first thing right there. What is that first thing? What is that? What is that first thing? 4x squared plus 4y squared plus z squared equals 16. What is that? Not a sphere. There's a distortion factor. It's going to be, it's not quite a sphere. It's like something sat on it or something, right? It's a so-called ellipsoid, yeah? It's, a, it's an ellipsoid, yeah? We talked about that. That was one of our quadric surfaces. So we have an ellipsoid. X equal to Z squared, what's that gonna be? What's X equal to Z squared gonna be? Well, X equal to Z squared is gonna be like a parabola, yeah? In the XZ plane, but then Y is free, correct? So what's that gonna turn that into? 
it's a giant sort of it looks it's going to look like you took a piece of metal and went whoop and folded it into a parabola yes in the xz plane it's basically it looks like a plane that you folded into a parabolic shape it's a it's a cylinder yes it's a cylinder of some kind okay uh, but it's a parabolic cylinder okay so x equal to z squared and this we're going to look at the intersection of these two things and we're going to try to write down a vector valued function that sketches out that curve. Yeah, we're gonna to try to see that curve by looking at the intersection of these two and write down a formula for a vector valued function describing that curve. Okay, so let's go over here. This will be, this will be fun. So let's first kind of graph these two, these two beasts. So here's that thing. Oh man, that thing's too, that's, that thing's teensy. So there it is, that egg shaped thing. That's cool, right? Okay, so it's an ellipsoid, but then x equal to z squared. Remember what's this gonna look like? What do you suspect it's gonna look like? Yeah, it's gonna look like a giant sort of parabolic trough looking thing, yes? Okay, like this, there it is, okay? In fact, uh, now this plane, the x, y plane is no longer helpful. I'm gonna get rid of that. You see that? You see where those things intersect, yeah? Okay, so you have the ellipsoid and you have, so there's, there's, oh man, there's X equal to Z squared. You can kind of see what's going on with that. It disappears if I, if I look too directly onto it. Yeah, okay. But we want to, we want to somehow parametrize that curve. That's the curve of intersection between those two. How are we gonna pull that off? What in the world are we gonna do? Yeah. Okay, the YZ. Okay, so you're saying if I look in the YZ plane, huh? Ah, interesting. Okay, so you're saying look in the YZ plane, please. Yeah. You can see that the relationship there. So by the way, if I'm in the YZ plane, what's true? So in the in, okay, so this is Daniel's idea. If this goes wrong, it's his fault. Okay. So if we're in, if we're in the YZ plane. What's true about X? What's X equal to? What's X equal to? X, if you're in the YZ plane, we're looking in the YZ plane right now, by the way, okay? If you're in the YZ plane, X equals uh, zero, yeah? So if we're on the surface of that ellipse, okay? Well, Oh, well, okay, so, so look, we just need to look at how Y and Z are kind of relating to each other, okay? So Y and Z relate via, okay, so let's think about this. Wouldn't it just be 4X squared, or, or not 4X squared, what would it be? Sorry, that's not 4, what is it? It's 4, 4 what? If X is zero, what is it? Four Y squared plus Z squared equals 16, yes? That's how those things would relate to each other. In fact, we could go down here and actually see that just to be sure. I could go, I mean, it's, it's, gonna, <laughs> it's gonna dimensionalize itself. X will just be everything. So it'll kind of shoot out towards us or whatever but we'll at least be able to see this. So watch, we can go 4y squared plus uh, z squared equals 16, okay? That's that tube right there. You see that red tube? Oh, wait, That's, that doesn't look quite right, does it? That, that thing goes all the way around, oops. So that thing goes all the way around this right here, yes? So that's not quite, that's not quite it. What we want is we wanna go around this thing like this, correct? We want Y and Z to go around this thing like this. How do we do that? Yeah. 
the intersection between these two surfaces. Okay. Mm -hmm. Y and then arbitrarily let's say like four with X and so we can say like X over four plus X over six or Y over six. All right, so you're saying, okay, look, X is like Z squared, correct? Or another way to say this is like Z squared is equal to X, correct? I mean, that's another way that you could kind of see this. Z squared is equal to X. So like if Z squared is equal to X, if you look in the XZ plane, you get some kind of shape, correct? Okay. Couldn't we just, by the way, I mean, we're probably slightly overthinking this. Can't we just, can't we just let Z, can't we just let Z equal to T? What would happen if Z was just T? Then what would happen? What would X be equal to? If Z is T, then, then what would happen if I'm on this, this uh, curve of intersection? What would X be? X would be T squared. And think about it for a second. You would have four T to the fourth, because uh, X is equal to T squared and I'm squaring that, yes, because of this equation right here that relates X, Y, and Z, correct? X is equal to T squared, if Z is T, four T to the fourth plus four Y squared plus, okay, what would be the last thing then? What's Z? T squared equals 16, yeah? Hmm. So wouldn't that kind of determine what our Y value was, yeah? This equation right here would determine what our actual Y value was. You would have to be kind of careful though, because Y is being squared. You know what I'm saying, yeah? But I could actually solve for y right here. So let me just, let, let's just kind of uh, play around with this for a second. So 4y squared is equal to 16 minus 4t to the fourth minus t squared. Uh, okay, so what is, what's y gonna be equal to? If I were to let this thing go all the way to completion, I would have to divide by four and then take the what? Square root? Now the problem is I have how many square roots when I do that? Two. So y would be like plus or minus one half times the square root of this junk right here. 16, one half because of the square root of one fourth is one half. Okay, 16 minus four t to the fourth minus t squared, okay? Okay, so Z is T, X is T squared, and Y is either the positive or negative one of these things. Now, what do you suppose is gonna happen with this curve? It's, it probably is, the way that we've set this up, it's gonna be split up into two pieces, yeah? So we can go down here, so watch this. We can go curve, I need three things, so it's expression, expression, expression. What was X equal to, again? T squared, okay, what was Y? Well, it's either positive or negative, this square root, correct? So we can go square root of, square root of what? 16 minus 4T to the fourth minus what? T squared but I have to take the square root and do what? Oops. In the world. 
square root. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's cute. Okay. Let me just go ahead and put that underneath the square root. Uh, oh, that's great. Now I'm over here. Okay. Awesome. So I have to take this whole thing and divide it by, no, not that. All right, I've had it. I'm going to put 0 0.5 out here, okay? Okay. Okay, now what about what about Z? What's Z? Is it, wasn't Z just T? Yeah? Okay, what's my parameter var variable? Uh, T. And I don't know, start value, in value. I don't know, let's just go with like T equal to zero. Uh, I don't know. You know, I have to be careful because I have to keep the stuff under the square root positive, right? So let's just let's just go a little bit of a little distance. Okay, let's go. Um, is two is two too much? Probably. One definitely isn't. So I'll try out to one first of all. Okay. Oh wow. So it is on the curve. Do you see that? Do you see it kind of sketch that black curve right there? Yeah. What if I went for T going from zero to, and I need to stretch this thing out. T going from zero to something else. I don't know, two. Okay, that's better. Uh, T going from zero to four. Oh man, it seems like it just kind of stops right there. That's that's curious. Okay, probably what's happening is the thing underneath the square root gets negative at that point. Okay. And what do you think that I would do to get other parts of this curve? Actually, hang on. So t goes from zero to two. What if if I go to two? What if I go negative two? Okay, now we get the other part of that thing. Do you see that? Okay, so now I get the other half of that thing. So this curve, this curve right here is the curve of intersection between those two things, but that's only half of it. How do I, how would I get the other half of it? You would have to take the negative square root, yes? It's the negative square root of this thing. I could figure out what values of T precisely work, but of course GeoGebra is just plugging in things that happen to work between negative two and T. Uh, the, the values of T that would definitely work, we would be able to get by figuring out when that thing under the square root is positive. Okay, so that's that's interesting. Okay, so sometimes these problems can get sort of uh, tricky for sure, right? There might be a different way to describe this by letting one of the other variables be T, but this, this is sufficient at least. So for instance, you could answer all kinds of questions. I could say things like, hey, what is the arc length of that curve? Yeah. And you would be able to sort it out, or what's the arc length of the curve of intersection? You wouldn't even have to, you wouldn't even need the other half of the curve. You could just compute the length of this half uh, by, using, by using the appropriate formula and then doubling the result. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? It's kind of interesting. Okay, moving on. These are just some basic kind of comprehension questions. For a specific value of t, do f of t, g of t, and h of t each produce a scalar? Do each of those produce a scalar or a vector? I'm just asking. f of t, is that a scalar or a vector? Remember, f of t was what x was equal to, right? So f of t is a Scalar, same thing with G of T and H and T, H of T. What about R of T though? Since that's the, the compilation of X, X, Y, and Z, right? F of T, G of T, H of T. That is a vector, right? That's a vector output. So R of T is a vector, whereas each of the component functions is a scalar, yeah? Okay. Now, last thing. Limits of vector valued function. I mean, it, it, it just behaves the way that you would think. If I let T go somewhere, I just see what happens to the vector. 
and I can go to each one of the components to sort that out, okay? So basically, if I wanna compute the limit as T goes to A of a vector valued function, I just basically take the limit in each of the component functions, yes? I take the limit as T goes to A of F of T and limit as T goes to A of G of T. And the limit will actually be a specific vector. Does that make sense? <laughs> After all, the output is a bunch of vectors, and the limit itself is going to be a vector. Okay? So let's look at an example here. What's the limit of this? What is the limit of this thing? What is, what's the limit as t goes to infinity? Right, and I'm just going to write this as an as a, a angle bracket vector so we see both notations at once. This is IJK notation, right? But what does the first component go to as t goes to infinity? e to the minus infinity, what's, what's that like? That's like one over e to the infinity, yeah? That's like zero, yeah? What about the second component, one over t? What's that go to as t goes to infinity? Zero. Now, what about the third component? That goes to three. So the limit itself ends up being a specific vector. In this case, it happens to be the vector that points straight up from the origin of, of link three. Yeah? Okay. So you can compute limits component by component. Okay. So it's, it's sort of what you would think. And that's going to be important in the next section because we're going to talk about differentiation of space curves. Right? You could talk about tangent lines on space curves if you wanted to, couldn't you? Right? And we'll have a way of computing derivatives at certain points on there, okay? Lastly, what about continuity of a vector valued function, okay? Well, remember, do you guys remember the definition of continuity from Calc 1? It said that the limit of the function had to exist as you went there but that wasn't enough because you could have had a jump discontinuity, right? Wasn't enough just for the limit to exist because there could have been a jump right at the point itself. The limit had to exist, but it also had to equal to the function value there. The limit had to be equal to the function value, yes? The same thing is true with vector valued functions because you can look at things kind of component wise again, just like we did in Calc 1. The limit as t goes to a of the vector valued function at t has to be equal to the vector valued function evaluated at a, okay? And a vector valued function is continuous on an interval if it's continuous at every point in that interval. So that means that all of those limits for any a exist and equals the vector valued function at that point, okay? Okay, one more question. What about the continuity of this? Well, I, to, to describe where this vector valued function is continuous, I need to look at each one of the component functions. So this, what, uh, okay, what interval is, what is the interval of continuity for this function, 2e to the minus t? What things am I allowed to plug into that and have a continuous function? <laughs> Everything minus infinity to infinity. That's the interval of continuity. What about this guy right here? What's the interval of continuity for that? Negative four to four square brackets, yes? I could actually plug in four and, minus, and negative four, yeah? And what about this thing? Uh, the lowest I can get with my t value would be, oh, wait, this shouldn't be x. What should this be? Sorry. <laughs> t, yeah? Okay. Uh, what is the lowest value I could plug into the logarithm? One. I can plug in anything from one to infinity. Now, all three of these things need to be taken into account to, to get the interval of continuity. Interval of continuity, what do you guys think? 
it's I equal to, think about it. So the first component doesn't give us any restrictions at all. The second one does, and so does the third. So uh, I have to take the second and third intervals into account to figure out what sorts of things I'm allowed to plug in. I cannot plug in anything one or below, yeah? So one would be the smallest number I could plug in. But what's the biggest number I can plug in and still hope to be continuous in the second component? Four. Okay. So the interval of continuity for this thing is just one to four. One is not included. Four is. Does that make sense? Okay. So again, limits go down to the level of just looking at the component functions and talking about the limits there. The same thing is true about continuity, okay? You have continuity, uh, you know, exactly where every one of the component functions happen to be continuous themselves. I wasn't even allowed to plug in anything less than or equal to one or less, yes, to begin with. But everywhere else, everything was good to go uh, other than up to four. Beyond four, I wasn't allowed to plug things in either. Okay. All right. That is it.